questions. Um, I do expect that soon one of them is going to uh, uh, run for Congress. <laughs> um, Aren't they already there? <laughs> no, no, well, they have representatives there uh, and, and have for a long time. Uh, the uh, document that we're considering begins, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings to our sons and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The Constitution has been amended a number of times, and uh, often uh, for uh, uh, what turned out to be wonderful reasons, um, ending slavery, um, allowing women to vote. Um, and so we, we often tend to think that uh, amendments and changes to the Constitution represent progress. But there have also been changes which uh, uh, really uh, uh, turned out not to be so wonderful. Um, the passage of prohibition, for example, uh, turned out to be a social disaster. Uh, was, uh, um, in whose wake uh, we still struggle. The courts have also, um, in particular the Supreme Court, has also affected the uh, meaning and interpretation of the Constitution. And part of what we want to do today is to uh, talk about uh, the history of corporations in the United States and uh, their uh, relation to the courts and the Constitution. And I, I think this is in the interest of making it plain that this is a living document uh, and that uh, uh, you can't just look at the Supreme Court, you have to look at the life of the country as a whole in order to understand uh, how these things come about uh, and what to think about them. So we have a, a distinguished panel here uh, ben Mutchler uh, is going to talk about uh, uh, early uh, uh, American uh, and early American incorporations. Ben is the director of the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. Um, then uh, Dan Likens, the, uh, um, um, who uh, was in our history department for a while and has now moved over to the, uh, the School of Business. Uh, and become the executive director for teaching and learning there. Um, we'll talk about the, the 19th century, basically, or a good part of the 19th century. And then Joseph Orozco, the associate director of the School of uh, um, History, um, Philosophy, and Religion, uh, will talk about uh, uh, contemporary events um, like the Citizens United decision. So Ben, let me uh, invite you to come up here first. and. Uh, uh, I have a hook, and uh, go over 20 minutes, I shall drag you off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to start with a few words about history, actually, uh, looking at this earlier period and why we might do it, given that where we're really aiming here is the present and Citizens United. And I'd say that there's really two major reasons that history might be illuminating in, in such a discussion. One, of course, is that history tells us about change and continuity over time, and it helps orient us with reference to the past. So we know that the present hasn't been just invented, uh, but in fact has a long trajectory. Um, and I think that uh, perhaps, we'll see, we haven't addressed rehearsal yet, the other two speakers will address that strain uh, more strongly than, than I will. Uh, but there's a second reason as well, which is that history explores the worlds that have been left behind. And in so doing, it enlarges our imaginative, excuse me, imaginative possibilities so that there are many things as we move through time that are simply gone and unfamiliar to us. But if we can recover those, it expands the way in which we might think about the present. Implicitly, the idea that things have been left behind is an invitation to think that things may be different again in the future. And so 
I'll be speaking today about the early corporation and illuminating, I hope, in a very sort of general way, we're trying to move fairly quickly here, um, a sense of the corporation that's different than the narrower way in which we conceive of the business corporation today. And to cut to the chase here, the notion is that this early idea of the corporation is that it should serve the public, um, and that acts of incorporation were intended to do just this. But lest we get carried away and think, well, in this earlier period, corporations really served all of us, the conception of the public at the time, particularly thinking about the polity, is much narrower than we have today. Virtually nobody at the time that I'm going to be talking about could vote if we looked at sort of overall numbers. Nor is the notion that uh, the corporation will serve the greater society um, something that's born of a kind of horizontal understanding of our relations, and I'm equal to you. Rather, it's about superior subordinate relations, and that person on high should, in fact, look out for the rest of us. So, um, I just want to say quickly, this is not my particular field of research. I'm drawing on several folks. This is not, not original. Gordon Wood and uh, Pauline Mayer and Joanne Meems and Oscar Mary Hanlon, to name a few. Okay, quickly, a definition of the corporation, so we'll have something work, to work with, and then I'll look at the colonial period, the revolution, and then some problems that arise in the wake of the revolution that handed over to Dan. So, corporation, um, this is a very old notion, stretching back at least to the Roman Republic, um, and it means to join in one body, the corpus, um, so that a group of people may make rules for themselves, um, function as a single person in law so that they can sue or be sued, they can hold and alienate, property, um, and that the corporation will exist past the lives of the people that have been incorporated, uh, usually through a royal charter in the period that I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, okay, with that in mind, let's talk briefly about the colonial period here. Um, there are, as part of the uh, colonial experiment in North America, uh, very clear examples of corporations at work. And while there's not many uh, acts of incorporation, they're significant for the early history of America, uh, not least of which are the Virginia Company, which is chartered in 1606, and the Massachusetts Bay Company, which is chartered in 1629, both uh, one year before settlement in Virginia and Massachusetts, respectively. Um, this consists of groups of adventurers that come together and they petition the crown for permission um, to form a corporation. They're given that through the charter and the terms of their holding of that uh, corporation are spelled out there. And were you to read those, and I'd actually encourage folks to, to do this. All of these charters are up online. It's a tremendously um, interesting uh, website sponsored by Yale Law School, Avalon.com. How many people have seen that? One, well, okay, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's excellent. It's got all sorts of documents, including these colonial charters that are up there. You know, if you were to read them, there's a mixture of motives in them. The language is rich, lots of different things we could pull out. In terms of thinking about larger themes, they are decidedly imperial. That is, in making the case for why the corporation should exist, uh, the English are arguing against the Spanish, and you'll see that the dark Spanish menace that pervades these documents, along with the Pope. Uh, conceived of as the Antichrist. Um, they are colonial in the sense that they are trying to think about how the British are going to be the local legitimate inhabitants of new lands that they're going to colonize, which means that they're also devoting their minds to the disposition of land, the people that might have been there, the Indians, uh, and what might be done. <coughs> um, they are frankly and unabashedly about conquest and use that uh, specific word. They're commercial, the, uh, the word that they use is to traffic, um, and it has a lot to do with enriching the larger empire. Uh, there's language of religion that pervades as well. There are missions of civility, and they will bring a greater glory to the, the persons that they'll civilize, the native inhabitants that they'll encounter. In the British case, with a kind of kinder, gentler uh, colonialism. Um, so, now, we want to pull out here is that they are overall conceived of as public works. And as I say, it's public in the sense of the ancient regime, the old order of the ages. 
public in the sense that those on high provide for those who are below. The aristocracy, the gentry are superior, which clearly so. Born, some are born high, and some are born low, and society consists of the reciprocal relations between the two. Protection from above in exchange for allegiance below. And so, men of prominence were charged with doing public works. And if you wanted to get something done in this period, you would often go to somebody who had the means and ask them to uh, provide for building a bridge, for example. Um, so that kind of sense emerges from these early charters. They're also explicitly economic, we might say it's economic and political. Um, these early charters are meant to draw a profit. And for whatever reason we attribute to, say, the Puritans coming to America, making a profit is a major one in the case that they make it at the time. Uh, maybe that's less surprising with Virginia, but it's true throughout the colonies. They're supposed to um, be able to profit. They also are political in the sense that they're setting up governance, a structure of how they're going to rule locally, and they're anticipating conflicts so that a lot of those rules and regulations have to do with the fear of inevitable conflicts that will arise as they colonize a new land. Um, the final point to make about these charters, and again, there's sort of a handful of these in the 17th century and early 18th century, the predecessors of later acts of incorporation that then explode in the early 19th century, is that there are bestowed in this old order of the ages as a royal favor so that the king, the queen, allows one to have one of these um, charters and allows for the act of incorporation, which also means that they can take it away. And that becomes important later when there's a question of whether the legislature can serve the same function or not. So the Virginia Company, founded in 1606, finds itself 20 years later in a kind of mixed position. In some ways, big success. Uh, 10,000 people have been brought over to the New World. Um, in other ways, not such a success. About 80% of them have died uh, off of deaths. <laughs> and there's a question of disarray in local governance and sort of willy-nilly fighting with the local inhabitants. And so the Crown takes over that charter, uh, makes it a royal colony, gives it a new charter, and that's the prerogative of the crown. The Mass Bay Company, again, established 1629, has a different set of problems where it actually, after a few years of starving and dying, people begin to uh, reproduce naturally, uh, the population is growing, the economy is healthy, and the crown is trying to realize profits uh, through regulation of commerce that the local inhabitants are not um, adhering to. Uh, those restrictions. And so the Crown looks at this and says, uh, no, we're going to vacate this earlier charter. There's too much local autonomy here. And they install a royal governor in 1691, who forever will be battling with the assembly. The governor gets a salary paid by the assembly. The assembly can tax. Governor is beholden to the king and is uh, given instructions. And some people argue this is sort of one of the sources of the revolution. In any case, finally, in these early charters, the crown is what it is, is the ultimate sovereign allowed uh, to give and to take away. Okay, so these are limited in number. Uh, they have a real utility as far as the public goes. Uh, they establish, uh, they've got a clear economic motive and they're establishing a means of government. Now with the revolution to shift forward, um, there's a real question about how this form is going to be used. Um, on the one hand, there's a notion with the revolution that having eliminated the king, and there was a formal relation between the king and the people, no more king, just the people, there's a notion, well, we now have a chance to have a new society and a new system of government. What will that look like when it's just the people? Who are the people? What are their rights and responsibilities? For, uh, what, from what uh, will those derive? Um, on the other hand, it's very difficult to invent a world anew and they inevitably are drawing on the cultural patterns of the past, um, and for our purposes here, uh, the uh, political and economic ones as well. So while the government sets itself out in these new republics to be grandly ambitious and remake republican citizens who will sustain this new system of government governance, it doesn't have the means to do that. Culturally, there's a lot of writing about what a citizen should do, but in terms of what government can do to flex its muscle, it needs money, uh, 
and it doesn't have the means to acquire that money. That is, the taxing power of the states is relatively weak. The citizens are not happy about large-scale taxes, although in our larger public debate it should be said that there is taxes at the local, county, and state level, before the states, the province level, going back to the earliest period. But these are always tense. People don't want to pay taxes if they have to. Um, and so there's this question then about what to do for resources and, and the way that the states essentially manage this uh, is to turn to this or, earlier form of corporation that is great groups of, of men, of means, uh, allow them to gather together as a, as a corporation, charter them, and have them do good things for society. Um, so it's important to say that these are not just businesses that are incorporated during the revolutionary period, last third of the 18th century. Uh, towns are incorporated, counties, districts, religious societies, learned societies, historical societies, medical societies, uh, general societies char uh, charged with the improvement of the body politic and their intellectual and cultural um, endeavors. Hospitals as well, but there is also business um, uh, that comes into this, uh, insurance companies, banks, turnpikes, uh, for-profit ventures that are trying to serve the larger public. What's interesting about this is, you know, the revolutionaries turn to these forms reluctantly. <coughs> they don't have that many other options. And there's a critique and a fear that goes along with this. A lot of the revolutionary generation, if you look at the language of it, it's about conspiracy and worry. Uh, about persons who hold power who may tyrannize the body politic. So, a few of those fears. One is something articulated in the larger um, context of the, of the revolution, imperium and imperio, a government within a government. The thought was you need to have one final source of authority, one animating place from which all power emanates. And the thought is, well, if we are giving charters to a select group of people, are we creating, in fact, sovereign bodies within the government as a whole? Is that dangerous? And the thought is, yes, that is dangerous. A limited number of people with special rights who live on after their deaths, this doesn't sound like a good idea. Uh, and they point to, again and again, the fear of the cabal, the conspiracy of such persons running roughshod over the body politic. It smacks of privilege bestowed from on high from the governor, uh, the government uh, towards the end of perhaps narrow individual profit, and there's worry about that. There's a good deal of confusion about public and private. In the 20th century, we have sharp divisions here. You think about the road decision, for example. In my period, in the 18th century, 17th century, no such division exists, but these kinds of issues around incorporation and persons who are gathered together, publicly recognized to do something for the citizens as a whole and profiting as well, raises the issue of where public ends and where private begins. And again and again, this emerges in the legislature. It finally raises the issue of sovereignty, who's in control of all this. Well, finally, these issues wind up bubbling up to the courts. And I think you'll hear uh, a good deal about various court decisions in the 19th century. I'll just, um, uh, mention a couple of these quickly and then conclude. Um, the question of public and private uh, winds up finally being adjudicated at the Supreme Court in Tarrant versus Taylor in 1815, which says that this whole cluster of corporations can be divided. There's a line between the public ones and the private ones. And so public is defined as those that are uh, uh, getting charters for the uh, corporations of counties, towns, cities. And these can be regulated by the legislature. You'll remember this earlier idea that the king could vacate a charter and give a new charter. Well, it's the same thing. The legislature can grant um, a charter for a town and take it away and then provide a new one. Same thing with cities and so forth. The other uh, corporations are deemed private. That is, colleges and this kind of entity, which is conceived of as serving the larger public, uh, but also banks and turnpikes and other business ventures and so forth. Um, the question of these private corporations and whether or not the act of incorporation has given them a vested right, property, that cannot be taken away from them without compensation arises in this period in the early 19th century 
with this division between public and private. And it winds up being something that if you were to read the legislative minutes of any of the colonies, you'd see again and again this question of, um, say, a corporation that's given the right to uh, dam a river. And uh, suddenly that starts to affect farmers downstream. And so people petition up to legislature and say help, and they have to have exceptions to the law. And the question is, are you damaging? Uh, if you change the dam, are you damaging the vested right of those who've been incorporated under the dam company um, to their profits? Are you hurting other people in the body politic by giving them those rights? And again and again, there's a endless sorts of futzing that has to happen in the legislature. That's a technical term, but futzing in the 18th century. Uh, yeah. um, so finally, I'll just talk about the uh, Dartmouth decision, which is a, a, a major one in this, in this regard. I think laying groundwork for things that we see now clearly have immense importance. And at the time, I just want to sort of convey this inchoate difficult sort of series of, of questions that arise that can't be fully resolved in a period, and later they have a kind of clarity. So the Dartmouth case in 1819 stems from one of these questions of who's finally sovereign in a corporation. The trustees of Dartmouth College uh, go and remove the president, who is a Presbyterian and Republican, capital R, uh, and the trustees are by and large Federalists and Congregationalists, and those of you who know the history of the period will know that's not a great combination. Um, so the president uh, appeals to the New Hampshire legislature, and the legislature, using its sovereign powers, drawing back on the idea that the legislature should be able to act as the king used to act, revokes that charter. Says we can we can do that and reinstall the president. The trustees sue, and it goes up to the state supreme court, and the supreme court upholds uh, what the legislature has done. It says no, this earlier idea where a sovereign power, the legislature in this case, can give this right, uh, needs to be upheld. But it makes it up to the Supreme Court on appeal, and Marshall reverses the decision. And he argues that Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, which says the state may not impair the obligation of contracts, in fact, holds here. And that the early charter in 1769 for Dartmouth College was effectively a contract, and that meant that the trustees had the ability to fire this president if they wanted to, and they couldn't have their charter vacated. Uh, the importance of this stemmed well beyond the colleges at the time that were affected to hundreds of corporations that had come into being to uh, address these local kinds of concerns in improving the economy and politics. Um, and so private corporations now were brought under the protection of the US Constitution. There were objections at the time. Thomas Jefferson prominently said, look, how can it, the legislature, which is representative of the people, tyrannize itself? How can we actually be afraid this is no longer the king, this is the people speaking, so the people should presumably be able to regulate. This is not the same situation as the old regime. Um, but that uh, argument did not hold sway. So just to conclude, I'd say that well, I leave, I'm not sure if we'll have an exact tag team here, but leave you off in the early national period with this earlier form of the corporation stemming well before the revolution, hierarchically conceived of, public good, um, being used during the revolution because of the inability of government to execute what it needs to, so it derives resources from, from doing this. Uh, there's the question of what's public and private in that. It's shading towards this division between public being uh, towns and districts and so forth, and business enterprises shading towards private. The ancient regime form of the corporation is being democratized. More and more groups of people can apply for um, uh, acts of the corporation and be granted them. And it's leading to endless sets of confusion, some of it bubbling up to the Supreme Court, much of it residing in a legislature where they are agonizing about how to adjudicate this fairly uh, tumultuous situation. They have no apprehension of our future, of Citizen United. Uh, they're sitting in the middle of this in 1819 through the, through the uh, 20s and 30s, and I turn it off to uh, Dan.
name's Dan Likens. Uh, just fair warning for you, uh, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to get a dose of that in the 1800s. I really break this down into two different sections. Okay? In addition to being a lawyer, I'm also a historian. And then I add a third a section that deals with what I currently deal with, which we'll get to. I want to start with a very simple fact. And we're going to come back to the Dartmouth case, case in a moment. But the reality is that as George W. Bush said, I am the decider. Well, when it comes to the Constitution, we need the same function. There is one arbiter of what the Constitution is in our system, and that is the United States Supreme Court. I hear constantly from my students and from other people that something the Supreme Court has ruled is unconstitutional. <laughs> no, it's not. The Supreme Court says what the Constitution is, and that is what it is, period. So I want to start out looking at seven particular cases, tracking this idea of corporate personhood, which I don't think is the best way to express it, tracking this to, to get to the point that we are today, with the understanding that while we may personally believe these decisions were bad decisions, while we may personally object and believe that they are unconstitutional. In reference to the law, they are the Constitution. And that is where we stand today. <clears throat> I want to pick up with uh, the trustees of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, that 1819 case that Ben mentioned. A couple of points on this, just to confuse things. Marshall was a Federalist. Okay, Marshall was a Federalist. So there may have been underlying political implications of his decision. Okay. But from a broader perspective, from a legal perspective, what the Dartmouth College case says is, yes, a charter is a contract. Charters issued by the royal government for Dartmouth, because that was its origin, it was a grant by the king. Charters issued by state legislatures which is, to this day, how, com how corporations come into existence. They are chartered by the action of state government. They are creatures of government. But one of the primary keys to that holding the United States Supreme Court in the Dartmouth case was that the charter was a contract, and it could not be infringed by the action of the state legislature. So that is, in fact, extending the protection of the contract clause of the Constitution to an artificial entity, to a corporation. And that is the beginning point. It's probably the first recognition that this artificial entity, this unnatural person, if you will, has constitutional protections. And whether you agree with that or not, there it is. That's where it starts. I want to skip ahead almost 70 years in reference to the issue of corporate personhood to the case of uh, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, which was an 1886 case. This, I'm sure you're all familiar with, is the famous head note case. This is uh, the case where the uh, clerk of the United States Supreme Court inserted in the head note. And for the non-lawyers among us, when you read a Supreme Court case, there are head notes. That's the synopsis of the case presented by the clerk of the Supreme Court. Usually that's about as far as most lawyers get. And in that head note, in that head note, the clerk stated, and this was not an issue in the case, this was a taxing matter, that clerk stated that corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and that they have the protections and the entitlements of due process and equal protections under the 14th Amendment. We'll come back to Santa Clara later in this presentation. So now we have corporations with the protections of the individual in reference to existing contracts. We have corporations wrapped into the 14th Amendment on equal protections and due process, thanks to Santa Clara County and a United States Supreme Court clerk. Following that, we've got Chicago and Milwaukee Railroad versus <clears throat> Minnesota. Chicago, Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad versus Minnesota, which was an 1890 case. 
You're going to see a lot of the railroads here, guys. You're going to see a lot of the railroads. In that Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul case, Illinois had set, in fact, uh, regulations, regulations of railroad rates. That state government regulated the rates that could be charged by that corporation operating in Illinois. In that legislation, in that law, there was no right of appeal according to the railroad company. The commission set the rate and that was it. There was no place to go to have that question. That was taken up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court held that the railroad's due process rights under the 14th Amendment was violated. So now we have contract protection, equal, equal uh, protections, equality of the law protections, we have due process protections. We're rapidly getting the 14th wrapped into the corporation. Those are individual rights according to the first writing of the 14th Amendment, I'll argue. We jump forward to a 1906 case, Hale versus Hinkle. This was a federal antitrust investigation of the tobacco industry. Uh, the tobacco industry was ordered, one individual in the tobacco industry was ordered to turn over sealed documents. That was appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in that case held that the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, the protection against unreasonable searches and seizures, extend to corporations. Okay, they refused, they were requested to extend the Fifth Amendment protections against self incrimination to corporations. They did not. They did not. And that still is the case today. It doesn't extend to corporations. But Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizures extended to corporations in 1906. And, and jumping out of that particular century, just to bring you up to modern days, you need to go back to 1976 in the Virginia Board of Pharmacy versus Virginia Citizens Consumer Council. This is advertising. Basically, it was illegal for pharmacists to advertise prices. That, in fact, was thrown out by the Supreme Court based upon a protection of businesses, that corporation's right of commercial free speech. So, we now extend free speech, granted a limited section more than the, the standard uh, political free speech, but we limit, we extend to corporations protection of the right of commercial free speech. Again, you may like the fact that they can advertise prices for pharmacy, pharmacological products. It also leads to television advertising for attorneys, so it may not have been a good thing. <laughs> Moving to 1978, First National Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, there was a Massachusetts law that outlawed corporate spending to influence voting on political referendums in Massachusetts. Made it to the Supreme Court, and on this one, the Supreme Court extended to corporations the protections of political free speech rights under the First Amendment. So we've got the 14th, due process, equal protections. We've got the 4th, unreasonable search and seizures. We've got first commercial free speech attaching. We've got first political free speech attaching. And then we come to 2010 with Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, where in fact the Supreme Court held that the restrictions on expenditures of political funds, funds to advertise for politicals, was in fact something that would chill, chill was their words, the expression of political free speech. So we fully extended political free speech rights to <clears throat> take it back to that document, not only corporations, but also unions. Be aware Citizens United lifts the restrictions for corporations and unions both. It's where we stand today. That's the law. That's it. Whether we think it's constitutional or not, that is the law. Corporations do involve themselves with and have the protection of many of the rights of uh, the Bill of Rights and the underlying Constitution itself in the Contracts Clause. Okay. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, that's the way it is. That's the law you're talking to. Okay. This is the law. But I'm also a historian. And historians do ask why, how, and with what effect. So I want to shift now a little bit to, to look at 
how we get to the point that corporations enjoy many of these rights of natural persons under the Constitution. And that's basically something that's going to happen in the 1800s. Okay? But to really get an understanding of this, I want to drop back just briefly to early colonial period, the colonial period and the early national period. In that period of time, as Ben has inferred, both individuals and government operated with at least skepticism about corporations. More candidly, often with open hostility toward corporations. These colonialists were the ones that held the Boston Tea Party. And it may have been a celebration of freedom for those of us today, but for those of us, those of those people throwing things overboard in Boston Harbor and in Charleston Harbor and in Philadelphia Harbor and in Freeport and in the Bahamas and in Bermuda, it was an act against a royal corporate monopoly. It was an effort to subvert the monopoly in tea granted to the American East Indies Company. And so you're looking at a population you're looking, with the revolution and the creation of the American government, you're looking at both a polity and a government that views most corporations from the point of view of royal, of royal monopolies. And it is hostile. They also view it from the traditional thing of, you know, the king granted, the king has the ultimate power of the corporation. This move to transfer that to the state <coughs> legislatures to government itself, to our non-royal government, is afoot. So while we have this negative and fearful attitude toward corporations, we also have that more local and regional attitude, and that's the belief that corporations are an appropriate form to deal with local problems. If you need a bridge and the people won't go to tax for it, then you charter a bridge corporation, and yes, it's the wealthy who get behind it, and yes, they are allowed to make a profit out of it, but that profit is highly regulated, the corporation has a limited lifespan, and it is there to accomplish a public purpose, to do a public good. And most early corporations in the early national and late, late colonial era, in fact, are along those lines. They deal with local problems, they are highly regulated. They are creatures of the state. They are under the control of the state. And most of the time, in the charter document itself, they exist for X period of years. They are for one limited purpose. And the amount of profit that they can take out of it is regulated in their charters as well. So that's how they're seen. At the point of the revolution, that attitude transfers but the question becomes, the question becomes, and this was debated in the Constitutional Convention, what level of government should control corporations? James Madison, in fact, in fact, presented a motion to the Constitutional Convention so that all authority to charter, regulate, and control corporations would shift to the federal government, would shift out of the state government and to the federal government. That was rejected, apparently <coughs> based upon a fear that connecting a potential monopoly with federal power was a bad thing. And, and I believe they're looking back to the American East Indies Company, looking back to those royal monopolies. So Madison's move to shift control of corporations to the federal level fails in the Constitutional Convention. So hence the power of the corporations, the power to create corporations, the power to regulate corporations maintains itself on the state level. And again, most of those corporations that were chartered at that time were used for local public purposes. The concept of a corporation merely to pursue profit was not part of the game. It wasn't there. By the early 1800s, there were 335 yeah, 335 corporations chartered in the United States. Most of those chartered by the states, all but three or four by the states instead of the federal government, and they were for public works projects. Canals, bridges, turnpikes, roads, those sorts of things. It wasn't until 1813 where we get the first American commercial corporation 
not incorporated to pursue a public purpose and accomplish a limited goal, but rather incorporated to join together a group of people for the pursuit of profit. And that was the Boston Manufacturing Company. Okay. It, along with all of the others, were tightly regulated by state government. Okay. They were regulated through the terms of their charter. And after Dartmouth College in, in 1819, what the Supreme Court said in Dartmouth College is you can't pull their charter unless the state reserves the power to do so in the charter. So after 1819, you start seeing a lot of charters with the reservation of all sorts of power on the state level, okay, responding to that Supreme Court decision in Dartmouth College. The issue develops in this era of control of the corporations. Control of the corporations by local, by local authority. And this is where Dartmouth Pitt plays an essential part. Because Dartmouth College case, the United States Supreme Court decision in the Dartmouth College case, was the first time that a United States court had upheld the rights of the corporation against the power of state government. It's the first time the court system said the state government doesn't have absolute arbitrary authority <coughs> over corporations. And that is a big change. That is a big change. It's shifting the power center out of the state level into the federal constitutional level. <coughs> Do note there was a lot of negative public response, the state government response, <coughs> and a lot of outrage about the Dartmouth case. But it generally was quiet because there weren't a whole lot of corporations. Okay? And even fewer of them operating across state lines. That changed with the Civil War. The industrialization of the American Civil War led to an amazing growth in the number and size of corporations. Many at the time expressed concern for this change. Lincoln's comment on this was, and I quote, as a result of the war, corporations have been enthroned and an aura of corruption in high places will follow, and the money power will endeavor to prolong its reign until wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. God grant that my suspicions be groundless. That was Lincoln during the Civil War. The expansion of corporate power and the limitations on the expansion of that power by state government authority to regulate it, <coughs> regulate them, that started before the Civil War with the expansion of the railroad system. In the 1850s, the brains behind the Pennsylvania Railroad, a fellow by the name of Thomas Scott, got the Pennsylvania State Legislature to revoke its tonnage tax. Pennsylvania had a tax on the tonnage of freight going across the state. Scott got the Pennsylvania Legislature to revoke that. The way he got them to revoke it was to promise state legislatures if they voted, legislators, if they voted against it, they'd run a railroad into their district. <laughs> uh, it should be noted that out of all of those public officials that voted for it in the next election, every one of them, except one, lost their re-election bid. There was, in fact, an investigation created to investigate bribery and corruption on this level. Thomas Scott was put in charge of appointing people to the investigation committee. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing came of it. <laughs> The continuation of state government regulatory authority over corporations created tremendous problems for those joint stock companies as they grew in wealth and power in the 1880s. Some method of shifting that authority out of the states had to be found, and it was with the passage of the 14th Amendment designed to protect the rights of natural persons with no apparent intent to apply to artificially created entities. It was with the 14th Amendment that the corporate lobby discovered the way to expand their protection on a federal level against state regulation. We see this in an 1877 case, Munn versus Illinois. Uh, the state of Illinois had, in fact, regulated freight rates for railroads going through the state. That got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in this one upheld the state power to regulate those rates by a 72 vote. One of the Supreme Court justices dissented, a fellow by the name of Field, and in his dissent, he said that the Constitution prohibited such, quote, invasions of private rights. 
the railroads had found their champion. To ensure that Justice Field's view would come to dominate the Supreme Court, the next election in 1880, a representative of a railroad magnate, Jay Gould, in fact contacted the Republican nominee, James Garfield, and offered him a substantial contribution to his campaign if Garfield would assure that no Supreme Court justices would be appointed unless they agreed with Justice Field's view. Oh. Gould said he would and he received a donation of $150,000. That couldn't get you a representative today. Okay. In 1880, it got you a president. <clears throat> he then appointed, after his election, a fellow by the name of Stanley Matthews, who was formerly a lawyer working for Gould's Railroad Company. In a circuit court case, and this is the precursor to Santa Clara, in a circuit court case, San Mateo County versus Southern Pacific, Field and the other justice sitting as appellate court justice, circuit court appeals on the Ninth Circuit. Back in those days, Supreme Court justices did the circuit courts. Concluded that the company had due process rights of the individual under the 14th. They made that ruling in that Santa Clara case, for that San Mateo case. Eventually that one was withdrawn, but it fed into the Santa Clara County case, the following headnote case. I do note in that head note, though, that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time had instructed the attorneys at the beginning of the Santa Clara case that they would hear no debate on whether the 14th Amendment covered corporations or not because, quote, we are all of the opinion that it does. So yes, it was a clerk, yes, it was a head note, and yes, it accurately, accurately reflects the opinion based on further rulings, the opinion of the Supreme Court. 14th Amendment attaches to corporations as natural people. So where did the court get this idea the 14th was written with the intention of applying to corporations as well as to natural people? They got that idea from one of the men who drafted the 14th Amendment. Senator Roscoe Collins was on the committee that drafted the 14th Amendment. After he lost re-election, he became an attorney for Southern Pacific Railroad. <laughs> and in the Santa, in the San Mateo County case, he went before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and declared that treating corporations as people was always the intent when they drafted it among the drafting committee. And he produced his secret notes of the secret deliberations to back it up. The San Mateo case was withdrawn before any decision was reached, but Conklin's statements apparently had an impact on the subsequent Santa Clara case. The 14th Amendment was written clearly to protect the rights of the newly freed Americans after the Civil War, and it quickly became a tool to protect corporations. Between 1890 and 1910, the United States Supreme Court heard 307 cases dealing with the 14th Amendment. Of those 307 cases, 19 dealt with the rights of former slaves, and the rest centered on the rights of corporations as people. If I may indulge two minutes. All right. <laughs> I'm just about to drag you off. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm moving quick. It's all Ben's fault. <laughs> the question of corporate personhood is settled law. Just is. It's settled law. It's been settled since 1880. The question is how far this personhood extends throughout the corporation, but it is settled law. And, and I want to suggest a different perspective on the question and the issues surrounding this idea of corporate personhood. Doug Guthrie, who is the dean of the School of Business at George Washington University, proposes that Instead of being concerned with personhood of corporations, we should instead look to their citizenship, since in his view, the personhood issue is settled. He urges a three-prong evaluation of citizenship in corporations. First, he says, in evaluating citizenship, we, much, we must ask ourselves, how much does an individual <coughs> contribute to support the state that protects him, her, or it? Second evaluation, the extent to which the individual is subject to the laws of the land. And the third evaluation, 
is the extent to which the individual can influence the laws that define point number one and point number two. He proceeds to point out that from 1900 to World War II, corporations paid taxes on an even level with individuals at about 9% of gross domestic product. Since Taft-Hartley in 1947, individual payments in the form of taxes have remained constant at about 9% of GDP, while corporation contributions have dropped over time to about 1%. They hit it in 2001, and they have stayed constant at 1% since 2001. As for liability, corporations enjoy much greater freedom than individuals. Since the inception of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, out of the 200,000 workplace deaths, 11 individuals have served jail time for any of those deaths. As to the power to influence law about the above two, the corporate lobby is a $3.5 billion industry that influences lawmakers' decisions daily. Guthrie concludes with the comment that, quote, if the die has been cast these many years on personhood, then the debate today must truly shift to citizenship. The key point is that if corporations want citizenship, which they have fought for for nearly two centuries to achieve, then they need to take on the responsibility of acting like citizens. Well, let me say uh, uh, thank you uh, all for being here today, and uh, uh, I'll try not to try your patience too long. I know we've been uh, listening to some very complicated things for the past 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, and it's always an honor to be able to uh, follow my prestigious colleagues in history uh, uh, and to be the philosopher here. Um, let me tell you, a, 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 I want to begin with a story. Um, so in 1992, I graduated from college and uh, I had a uh, bachelor's degree from a prestigious liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon, uh, which essentially uh, meant this, right? I was a philosophy major. And so that meant that I, uh, even though I had uh, a, a nice name uh, in, uh, in, you know, uh, behind me in terms of where I went to college meant that I was unemployable as a philosopher. <laughs> so uh, I went looking around for work and I found a job in downtown Portland at a market research center. So my job was to call people in their homes and to ask them questions. So most of the time I was doing uh, what I thought was fairly interesting work. We were contracted by many, many people from all around the country to call people up and ask them their opinions about different things. And some of the times we were asking about utility services, and so they were sort of customer service uh, types uh, of work. But now and then we'd get something which I found interesting, but then I became slowly very wary of. We were calling people to ask them uh, opinions about political matters. And uh, I was always, uh, I, I majored in political philosophy, so this was always very interesting to talk with people on the phone about what they thought about politics. But then I started to notice some very interesting things about the questions. So if any of you have ever done market research or political poll uh, in, uh, work, you will realize that uh, this is, when you're doing it in a scientific way, quote unquote, you have to follow the script uh, and ask questions. And if people ask you, well, what do you mean by that question? You can offer some clarification, but you're not meant to actually engage. You're just there to record the information that you hear. And so frequently we were doing uh, a nationwide uh, a polling. And I remember particularly I was calling people in California and asking them their opinions about a primary there to elect, uh, re-elect Barbara Boxer. And so I would ask people questions like this. In your opinion, if you found out that Barbara Boxer's husband had been involved in the banking scandal in which he embezzled $14 million, would you be more likely or less likely to vote for Barbara Boxer? And then people would stop and I would hear them go, hmm, is that true? And the response that we were ordered by the manager to say was, I cannot comment upon the question. I would merely like you to register your opinion question. Wow. Right, and so I frequently started to notice these kinds of questions popping up and I would ask the manager, well, who is our contract with? And we were not allowed to know that. We 
this might introduce bias into the <laughs> survey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those of you who know anything about this, this is called push polling. It's a frequent political tactic. Uh, only one state in the country has tried to outlaw this form of uh, electioneering, but it's quite common. Uh, and right when I asked my uh, manager about what we were doing, I said, "There's something dishonest about this, isn't there? I mean, we're not really. I mean, we're 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 seeding disinformation to people." And his response was, "No, we're not. What we're doing is we're simply asking people's opinions and." Whether or not they want to take it as true or not is their business, not ours. So while we were, uh, so the distinction here is this, we were not necessarily informing, we were just getting opinions. This kind of distinction is at the heart of the 2010 case Citizens United. So what I want to talk a little bit about is the history, the legal history leading up to Citizens United and trying to understand this kind of distinction between uh, advocating for a position, because we were not in, in my job saying, you know what, you should vote for Barbara Boxer, or you shouldn't vote for Barbara Boxer. In fact, none of the questions were ever phrased that way. We were just talking about issues. <laughs> this distinction then is at the heart, like I said, of, of Citizens United, and the question is how are we to understand this distinction about talking, free speech, and the protections of the First Amendment, corporate personhood. So, um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some reactions to Citizens United uh, that I found really interesting. There was a kind of a rhetorical, what's called a meme, that sort of showed up shortly after 2010 when the Supreme Court uh, decided uh, Citizens United. So almost immediately, Chuck Schumer, Democrat of New York, had this to say about the decision. He, he says, quote, with the stroke of a pen, the court decided to overrule the 100-year-old ban on corporate expenditures and override the will of millions of Americans who want their voices heard in our democracy. A few weeks later, right, uh, President Obama, in his State of the Union address, says this. With all due deference to the separation of powers, right, and the, all the Supreme Court justices were sitting there in front of him, he was saying this. It was quite, quite a shocking moment, actually, because he's talking to them this. He's telling them, essentially, I think you did something wrong. And if you watch this clips of this, you see them shaking their heads. They're very, very defensive postures. They took, in fact, you see um, uh, one of them mouthing, going, like, no, that's not what we did. So it created a very sort of hostile, confrontational relationship with the Supreme Court. President Obama says, with all due deference to the separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. <coughs> I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that would help correct some of these problems. Close quote. So this story started to come out by many Democratic politicians that somehow we had undone 100 years of regulations of corporations in the United States. And what I think we've seen is that's not true to some extent. But on some extent, it is true, right? So on the political meter, the truth meter, right? Partly true, partly false, what the Democrats are saying about what Citizens United did. So what did, what is this 100-year-old history that we're talking about here? As uh, Professor Likens was pointing out, right, in the uh, 19th century, right, or the late 19th century, the period that we call the Gilded Age, <coughs> Right, we see corporations vigorously working to try to enshrine their rights to continue seeking profit in the United States and doing all these kinds of end runs around legislatures and the judiciary to gain that kind of power. And many people, many corporate interests are gaining massive amounts of wealth uh, with the help of the state. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, you start to see uh, reform movements against some of this, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, powers by corporations. And you get what starts in the early part of the 20th century as the progressive movement, trying to limit the power of corporations and their influence in the political process. And one of the people who's associated early on with this movement is President Theodore Roosevelt. He was frequently charged with doing the bidding of corporations, and he wanted to distance himself from those kinds of interests. And so in 1905, in his address to Congress, uh, Theodore Roosevelt said this, quote, 
All contributions by corporations to any political committee or any political purpose should be forbidden by law. Directors should not be permitted to use stockholder money for such purposes, and moreover, a prohibition on this kind would be, as far as it went, an effective method of stopping the evils aimed at corrupt political acts." Close quote. So you start to see this worry in the early part of the 20th century that corporate power is corrosive to democratic processes, and that the involvement of corporations and corporate money in the political processes tends to feed corruption and something had to be done about it. And so a couple of years later, uh, Benjamin Tillman, who was senator of South Carolina at the time, proposed a bill uh, to do Theodore Roosevelt's bidding. And this became law in 1907 and it was called the Tillman Act. The Tillman Act prohibits corporations from making direct financial contributions to uh, campaigns for federal office. Right, so the idea here is that corporations cannot make direct financial, right, this is an important phrase, direct financial contributions to campaigns for federal office. This is still the law today. This is something that we need to understand when we talk about the corrosion of our democracy and what corporations are doing. Corporations are not allowed to give money directly to candidates or to campaigns. What about right? What's called direct financial contributions. I'll explain what they can do in just a second, uh, which has to do with a little bit about what I was doing with the push pull. Right? So uh, the problem with the Tillman Act was this, was that all these prohibitions in law were made, but there was no provision for any kind of enforcement mechanism. Right? So it said, you can't do this, corporations can't do that. But then the question was, well, who's going to enforce this? And that was never put into law. And so, right, probably for some direct reasons, right, you have this law, but no enforcer. And so uh, corporations were able to continue doing what they were doing in a lot of ways because there simply was no body to enforce this law or to regulate elections in any kind of way. So surprisingly, it took almost uh, 60, 70 years before we uh, fixed this with the creation of the Federal Elections Commission in 1971 uh, through 1974. Uh, I'll skip ahead a little bit right, uh, to uh, the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947. Right, what did this do? The Taft-Hartley Act prohibited unions and corporations from making what's called independent expenditures during campaigns. Right, so what's, what's going on here? The Tillman Act prohibits corporations from giving money directly to candidates and campaigns. Taft-Hartley then comes along and says, and guess what? Corporations and corporate money cannot be used for things like advertisements uh, or to help bankroll campaigns in some independent way. So an independent expenditure is defined largely something like this, is that in a political campaign, an independent expenditure is a communication that expressly advocates the election or defeat of a clearly identified candidate that is made not in cooperation, consultation, or in concert with, or at the request or suggestion of a candidate. Right, so an independent expenditure is when a corporate body, right, well, we, independent expenditure committees also have another name called political action committees. So a political action committee can make a, uh, according to Taft Hartley, would not be able to make a, uh, a, camp, uh, a commercial that says, vote for Smith for Congress, right, independently of being coordinated with it. So the campaign for Smith has its own ads that they're putting out there saying, hey, do this and do this. Taft Hartley says corporations cannot make uh, advertisements to help any particular candidate themselves. Now, this is the important thing. Citizens United overturns Taft Hartley. In 1947, uh, the, the Congress said that corporations should not be able to, uh, to engage in this kind of speech. Right? Independent expenditures, which are independent endorsements, essentially, of candidates for office. So, uh, the important distinction here is what's called express advocacy. This is what my manager was telling me, right? When I said, hey, isn't this something uh, slightly dishonest? His response is, well, we're not telling people how to vote. We're not mentioning, you know, do this or do that. We're just simply talking about issues. So there's an important uh, distinction in Supreme Court uh, law having to do with this called express advocacy, which is the act of communicating a wish that someone vote for or against a specific candidate or legislative measure. In 1947, right, Congress prohibited corporations from being able to engage in that kind of speech, express advocacy. 
We skip ahead uh, a few uh, decades uh, to the Federal Elections Campaign Act of 1971. Finally, it was decided, hey, look, this is largely after the, 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 the disaster in Watergate. We need to do something to make sure that elections are not corruptible uh, and that politicians aren't using campaign money for all sorts of nefarious and illegal purposes. Who's going to regulate this? The Tillman Act said, hey, we should have regulations, no enforcement. Right? In 1971, Congress decides we need a body to regulate federal elections and to make sure that the, mo that the money that's going in is not illegally uh, uh, there. And so the, this is the creation of the Federal Elections uh, Commission, FEC, which orders right, the, this act that's amended in 1974. What it does is it orders that contributions to federal election campaigns has to be disclosed, it has to be public, right? it makes elections much more transparent, and it limits the amount that individuals and groups can give to federal campaigns, right? direct contributions. So we have in federal election law large amounts of regulation about how much money people can give directly to campaigns and to candidates. So we do have regulation of, uh, of this kind of money. And until 2010, right, we were also regulating independent expenditures. A couple of things start to come together that allow that undermining to take place that happens with Citizens United. In 1976, an important case of Buckley versus Vallejo, Vallejo, the Supreme Court upheld that uh, there should be limits to contributions to candidates for federal office. So this was a challenge on the Federal Elections uh, uh, Commission's uh, Act, right? And so the Supreme Court said, yeah, it's a good thing to limit direct contributions to candidates. Right? That's a good thing because it uh, uh, allows there to be a non-corruptible uh, candidate, right? Corporations shouldn't be allowed to just pour tons of money into uh, a person's campaign. But the important thing about Buckley is this. They looked at uh, some of this law about independent expenditures and said, uh, uh, the court decided that uh, limits on independent expenditures, independent advertising, were a violation of the First Amendment. Spending money by individuals and groups to influence elections, the Supreme Court said, is a form of protected free speech. So Buckley is a case in which the Supreme Court says, look, if a corporation wants to make its own advertising campaign, right, independent or not in consultation with the actual campaign of the candidate, that should be allowed to be done under the First Amendment because giving money is an express form of indicating a desire or a wish that you want something to happen. Right. Money is free speech, the Supreme Court says in Buckley. Well, this bothers a lot of people, and so finally, right, we get to the 2000s, and uh, we have what's called, uh, in some parlance, the McCain-Feingold Reform Act, or uh, as it was known officially, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. So the, uh, the McCain-Feingold Act does two things, or is meant to address two things that started to develop, and has to do slightly with what I was talking about with push-pull. The McCain-Feingold Act limits the amount of soft money in campaigns. So money that's not directly raised for a candidate or a campaign. It limits the amount of soft money that a, a national party can use. And it put limits on the kinds of issue advocacy ads that corporations could create. Right? Defining what they call electioneering campaigning. So an electioneering campaign is something like this. Right, where a corporation or a group decides to have some kind of an independent um, uh, ad. Right? So these are now legal according to Buckley. A corporation can create some kind of, a, uh, uh, of, a, of an ad right? and uh, talk about an issue. Right? They don't necessarily say vote for a person. They don't necessarily say don't do this. They just simply say, do you know that this took place? Right? What's an example of, of issue advocacy? Well, the Swift Boat campaign was a classic example of issue advocacy. In no time did they ever say, don't vote for this candidate or don't do this. They just simply said, did you know, it was sort of like a history lesson, did you know that in the past this is what John Kerry was like? Right, it's sort of in the same way that I was doing push bowling. If you knew that Barbara Boxer, uh, her husband, did this, would you do this? In no time have I ever said, you should do this. I just simply said, did you know this issue? So we're talking about issues. 
And so the McCain-Feingold uh, Act tried to limit that kind of speech because they believed that that was corrosive of the process. People would get confused about what was going on. If you constantly saw swift boat ads, you had people calling them up. And, right, this was actually one of the most nefarious examples of push-pulling came, I think it was in the uh, primary in 2004, in which uh, George W. Bush did some push-pulling uh, about uh, John McCain. And the question was, would you be more or less likely to vote for John McCain if you knew that he had an illegitimate black baby? <laughs> right? John McCain, of course, had adopted a, a baby from uh, Bengal. Right? And so, technically, he had an illegitimate black baby. Right? But the way that this was framed and such led people to believe something about John McCain's character. And this is quite common. So the McCain-Feingold Act was an attempt to try to rein in that kind of discussion in the political process. Right, so let's get to Citizens United. What does Citizens United do? Well, let's understand the case first of what was going on. Citizens United is a, a, a group, a political advocacy group, uh, and they produced in 2008 called, a film called Hillary the Movie, which was quite disparaging of uh, Hillary Clinton and said that she was manipulative, lying, uh, frequently engaged in criminal conspiracies and so forth. And they wanted to air this movie uh, nationwide during the Democratic primaries in 2008. Now, the Federal Elections Commission, because of McCain-Feingold, ruled that Citizens United could not air this uh, uh, movie because they considered it a form of electioneering, it was sort of like push-pulling. Uh, and they believed that it violated McCain-Feingold. Well, Citizens United then decided to take this all the way to the Supreme Court. They sued the FEC to be able to distribute their movie. And the Supreme Court ruled that, as a matter of fact, they said, any kinds of limits on issue advocacy are limits on the First Amendment. If people want to talk bad about John McCain's illegitimate baby, or they want to talk about how uh, uh, Hillary is involved in criminal conspiracies, right? Uh, those are talking about issues, right, and those should be allowed as part of free speech. And so the Supreme Court said, look, uh, direct contributions to corporations, uh, by corporations to federal candidates and campaigns uh, is, uh, uh, is prohibited. Corporations cannot give money directly to the political process in that way. So Tillman is still in effect from 1907. What is gone are prohibitions on this very murky area called issue advocacy or independent expenditures in which groups are not working in consultation or direct coordination with campaigns but have an opinion. They want people to think a certain way. And Citizens United had said that putting any kinds of limits to that kind of speech, even if it's done by a corporate group, is a violation of the First Amendment. Notice that in Citizens United the issue of corporate personhood does not come up. They don't talk about corporate personhood. This is an issue about free speech. It's previous cases that have established corporate personhood, and the Supreme Court has just simply said that persons, whoever they are, can engage in this kind of speech. So there have been, uh, let me let's sh shift a little bit to, to talk about this, right? So what do we have? We have regulation on the kind of money that can come into campaigns. What we don't have any longer is the regulations on this gray area about issue advocacy. And there have been attempts to try to regulate it, but Citizens United undoes it. And so we are left in this kind of realm in which uh, people can pour lots of money into these kinds of campaigns that result in misinformation, confusion, and uh, some people believe is corrosive. Right? But we do have regulations. So corporations can't run amok entirely, but they can confuse us significantly. Right? That's really the issue, right? is that corporations have an enormous amount of money to swamp the field with messages that can be half-truths, no truths at all. Right? That, uh, that what Citizens United has decided that the government is not in a position to decide right, who gets to talk about what issues. Now, there have been attempts, there are attempts now to try to do something about this, of course. Many of you I know uh, from the community are involved in these efforts. There is a nationwide effort called uh, Move to Amend. And the Move to Amend movement <coughs> is a movement that's trying to push for a constitutional amendment 
that would put into law to the Constitution two points, right? Corporations should not be considered natural persons, and money should not be considered speech. And the hope is, in some sense, to revoke the personhood of corporations so that they would not receive the same kinds of protections of the, the Bill of Rights as natural persons would. Right? And so that would uh, uh, undo many of the cases that Dan was talking about. And then the second point is that money should not be considered speech, directly overturning Buckley in 1976. So this is the, the, the attempt to I move to amend. Now, how much time do I have? I'm out of time. <laughs> let, me, um, let, me, let me say something, let me say something like this, uh, and I'll end this way. Um, my, my sense of the move to amend attempt, and this is something that has recently been endorsed by, uh, of all people, Barack Obama. He believes, in fact, and has said publicly that he believes that a constitutional amendment is needed to, uh, to overturn Citizens United, perhaps on these two parts, right? that corporations are not persons and that money is not speech. This is a very complicated issue, and my, my sense is this, is that the move to amend, if a constitutional amendment of this sort could be passed, it would be a first step. But let's be uh, clear, we should be under no illusion that this is going to solve the problem of corporate influence in the political process. This is a deep-seated part of our uh, uh, country going back almost 200 years, and is not going to be undone by uh, uh, trying to limit corporate personhood. In fact, I think that what we're going to see is that the problems having to do with this are really about structural imbalances in our economy. The fact that there are large concentrations of wealth right, that get to corrode our system. And this is going to have us, this is going to, I think, force us to raise the question about capitalism. This is going to have us talk about taxes and who pays what. Right? And so we're going to have to talk about those kinds of reforms. How is wealth produced and distributed in this country? And it's also going to have, uh, I think, a lot of these problems have to do with something that we have an outmoded political system. We have institutions in our government that are directly about uh, prohibiting the public participation of large numbers of people. In, uh, and it was designed this way. That's something that we need to understand, is that our government institutions made in the uh, 18th century are about concentrating power for small groups of people. We have been steadily increasing who can partake in the political process, but there are certain structures that are just simply outmoded and undemocratic. The Electoral College, for instance. The U.S. Senate, for instance. These are unrepresentative bodies that frequently stand in the way of changes in taxation representation and various kinds of rights. And so we need to have a much broader conversation than just simply corporate personhood. We need to have a discussion about the political structures of our democracy and the political structures of how wealth is produced and distributed. And I think that uh, the move to amend movement and all these other sorts of local movements that are about disempowering corporations are good to the extent that they begin a discussion about these issues and raise awareness about what corporate personhood is and we can start to talk about this history in which ways but realize that the work that we're going to need to be doing is about inequality in our society at a much deeper level and right today we celebrate or some of us at least do the one year anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement in Zuccotti Park in New York right? who has raised the issue of inequality the issue about jobs and who has access to what when that discussion has started, we need to continue deepening those discussions. We need to deepen the discussion about participation. And uh, I realize that it's not just the corporations that are the bad people here. There's a lot of corrosive corruption that we need to deal with. Senator, uh, who tried to um, find out 
what the terms of it were, was it unable yes. to. It's a, it's been called NAFTA on steroids. Uh, in a commercial, but also commercial political <coughs> agreement, um, in which multinational corporate interests who are writing this um, will, uh, will be able to cause really a lockdown. And it, this is how I perceive it. Uh, an inability on the part of any nation state level, uh, whether it's com community to the entire nation state, to, to, to contradict, to supervene, to supervene, to reject any of the provisions of this, quote unquote, um, I don't even know if it's a treaty, an agreement mm -hmm. among those who own and control on a global level. Can you read, can any, can you relate that to what has been uh, under discussion here, to the extent that you know anything about the Trans-Pacific Partnership? And you? It's on the very much on the QT. It's on the well, I, what I would say is I, I've heard about it. I don't know, I'm not that familiar uh, with it in particular, but this is not new. And in fact, this has been going on since the early 90s, right, uh, with uh, NAFTA, GATT, and the WTO. These provisions already exist, right? The WTO, the World Trade Organization, is a treaty which most nations now have agreed to, which uh, are about uh, economic uh, globalization and created various kinds of rules that say something like this, is that no nation state can pass any kinds of laws, whether they be environmental regulations, consumer protection regulations, that somehow would impinge on the corporate profitability of, of multinational corporations. And so, for instance, if a state decides to pass a law that bans a certain kind of know, chemical additive for gasoline or uh, put limits on uh, how many fish can be netted, uh, for instance, something like this, and that that somehow impacts uh, a, a corporation in some sense, then the nation state must pay an indemnity to the corporation. That is, how much would the corporation lose in profit if uh, the state passed this kind of law? This is, uh, this is stuff that's been going on uh, uh, with NAFTA for years now. There's all these famous cases in which the United States, Canada, and Mexico have gone back and forth suing each other uh, for uh, these kinds of laws, for famous cases in which California passed a uh, a law that would ban a certain kind of fuel additive that was seeping into the groundwater. It just so happened that a, a Canadian corporation was the one that made that additive and would lose a, a significant amount of money if California banned that additive to be added uh, into uh, gasoline. And so uh, Canada sued and said, well, look, if, Can if California passes this regulation, then you, the U.S. citizen, must pay us, a private corporation in Canada, Right, all the profits that we would lose over the decades that this law would be in place. And so what you're talking about here with this agreement is not new. We've been doing this uh, since uh, 1994 when NAFTA went into existence and then at the same time with the World Trade Organization. But so to speak about the connection, what we're seeing now is that corporations are not purely just national now. They're multinational operating in many, many different jurisdictions. And you're starting to see a creation of a legal realm to protect the rights of corporations operating at that kind of global level. And you have a level of now global governance that says that when governments, either at the uh, national or local levels, pass laws that would infringe on corporate profitability, they have to pay for the loss of profits. Right? And that, in some sense, to, to echo what Dan was saying, that's the law that we've been living with now for over 20 years, and it's only continuing to develop and strengthen. I'd like to ask Dan a question too. Is this this evolving <coughs> global governance structure is really following what you outline as having happened here in the United States? But whereas the federal government is able to preempt the, the, the state government, which is able to preempt local governance, what's happening now with the WTO and, and now the TPP is that it looks to me as if the corporations, the global corporations, are now going to be able to preempt <coughs> sovereign nations and, and everything below that. In other words, it's disempowering the sovereignty of individuals, states, um, and literally nation states. Yeah. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. The, the, the WTO, an interesting organization, to say the least, 
Um, when you look at the concept of international law, which is what we're talking about, uh, throughout the, the, the long run of history of nation states, international law has been, um, in many regards, a gentleman's agreement uh, to be gender biased by it. Um, because if, if a nation state chose not to follow the norms and the customs, then they were free not to follow it. Now, if there were consequences, they're willing to pay the consequences, that's fine. WTO is, in fact, um, other than the Nuremberg trials, uh, the first time I know of where what can be seen as international law actually has coercive authority behind it. Uh, and that coercive authority is uh, the economic boycott process of, um, of the combined members of uh, the 167 nation WTO as to you know, paying for loss of profits. Well, I mean, if the Canadian company wants to sue in the States and, and the American courts go, go away, there's no way to collect in the United States. The coercive authority is, if that happens, then all other 166 nations of the WTO are obligated to respond with boycotts and, and other economic consequences. Uh, so the point you make about subverting uh, national level authority and creating a, an internationalist legal system yeah, the WTO has coercive authority. You can call anything a law you want to call a law. If there's not coercive authority behind it, it's merely a recommendation. Okay? <laughs> WTO has coercive authority. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, I, 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 was un, I was under the impression that the WTO and this new one that they're talking about, the Pacific Trans thing, uh, that, it, that it actually has set up its own courts. I mean, it's actually set up its own arbitration systems that are secret courts. At the, uh, and that are manned by people we don't know who, uh, for what purposes, or anything like that. And the, the uh, uh, results of those decisions are binding. And then I guess that's when all the coercion comes in. But uh, Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the WTO uh, hearing structure to, to say whether uh, there's their secret tribunals or not. Uh, the WTO does have an arbitration process, and there's not to my knowledge, formal hearings, it is uh, a classic arbitration process and their decision. Uh, and the arbitration uh, hearings, uh, to my knowledge, aren't secret and closed. Now, if there's another level of enforcement, uh, I may not be aware of because I'm not uh, really an expert in international law or the WTO. I mean, I, I don't think they have like helicopters yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It seems like I've heard recently in the news about some large nonprofit, maybe political, being challenged, uh, the status of it being challenged because it doesn't have a public benefit and it didn't necessarily even state in its papers of incorporation that it intended to have a, a public benefit. So, my question is um, is this a way, you know, one, uh, maybe another way of getting to your citizenship approach, um, going back and enforcing what we already? what laws we already have on the books about who gets to be a corporation who has corporate rights. And then I wonder if any of you would have any comments about the suggestion that maybe we should be calling for a constitutional convention mm -hmm. by Larry Lessig. Um, what was the first question? <laughs> Uh, nonprofit status. Yeah, the, the nonprofit status is really, uh, uh, domestically in the United States, nonprofit status is, is purely a, a, a recognition by the IRS that uh, this corporation is operating for a public good, uh, public hospital, those sorts of things. So when you call a company nonprofit, it doesn't mean they're not making money. Uh, it, it means they're getting a tax advantage, they're getting a tax exclusion. Now, if, if there is a corporation that has gotten a tax status as non-tax because they're accomplishing some public purpose, and they cease to accomplish that public purpose, then the IRS can pull the, the tax benefit. But, you know, what, what the state's charter is a non-profit company, they call anything they want non-profit. The, the key is whether the IRS is going to recognize them under the code. Uh, as to constitutional conventions, 
Um, well, every once in a while, everything needs to be revised. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Dan, um, who was the person who talked about the look to the sense of citizenship? Who, who um, that's uh, Doug Guthrie, G U T H R I E. Okay, thank you. Uh, and let me make sure on the spelling. And he is the, the Dean of the School of Business at George Washington University as G-U-T-H-R-I-E. Doug Guthrie. Thank you. There is a movement afoot nationally and even in our own county. Uh, I think the group here calls themselves the Benton County Community Rights <coughs> Organization. Has anybody, has that been just, I missed some of this presentation. Philosophically, I'm already aware there's a tremendous problem. And as a human being, I'm already an activist trying to do what I can to make it more better for all of us in a democracy. Has anybody talked about that? Because I'm not a leader or an activist in that particular issue, but I know there are some people in this room that are. And these people here, all of you, most of us have come here because we know there's a problem. Maybe a few of us came because we were just wanted to get more information. My thinking is if you don't do something about it, you decide to learn about it, we haven't done enough. And there's two sign-up sheets outside for move to amend for this Benton County Community Rights Group. Are you all signed up? And if not, why not? Okay, any other questions? But that was a question. Has it been talked about? Has anybody no, brought that issue up? What, what's, so, what's going on locally? What's going on here? What's really happening on the ground? Someone want to address that? What's that? Oh. To respond back to this question? I am. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, there's a very active move to amend organization here in Corvallis that put it on the ballot. Right. You know, and, and, and they were also very active in getting the council to make a resolution requesting. You know, I mean, that's what it's about. Right. Uh, is requesting a constitutional amendment. We're also very active in working on our state legislature. We intend to get a, a resolution through our state legislature, which is the first formal step in a constitutional amendment process. Good. Like, so yeah, there's people doing stuff. There are people doing stuff. How about that second part, though, the Benton County Community Rights Workers? <coughs> trying, trying to work at a, at a new layer of, uh, of democracy. I can address that. Um, I'm, with, I'm with the founding members of the, what we're calling the Benton County Community Rights Coalition. We started out as DMO Free Benton County, and we are organizing to put an initiative on the Benton County ballot um, to assert our right to govern ourselves um, by declaring our right to a sustainable food system within Benton County. Um, we are also declaring the rights of the enabling rights of nature to exist, persist, and um, uh, recharge their natural cycles. We're also declaring that the people of Benton County are sovereign and that we have the right to govern ourselves. I have copies of the initiative, the draft initiative um, that you can ask me about. We're also putting on a democracy school um, on October 5th and 6th um, that is being put on by uh, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund out of Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're trying to educate the people here in Benton County about our right to govern ourselves and how we can initiate that through our, we are a home rule county, um, through the initiative process so that we can say what goes on in our community. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be out at the table. Um, okay, I think you were first. Uh, well, i just like to ask the panel a question looking at, you know, what's the, what do you see coming up as the next Citizens United as far as we know that, you know, while we're trying to put a stop, you know, with an amendment possibly to take some things back, the other side is working to what's the next step, what's the next cog that they would be doing if they can get more um, people in the Supreme Court, get more things in their favor. So I guess, you know, do you, do you see where the, where that's going? In, Taking giving more rights to I'd love to make a projection on that, but there's too many very, very smart people figuring out too many very, very genius ways to get around everything. <laughs> well, that's what I meant. What are, what are they? What is the corporation? What's their next move? 
Yeah, you, that's what I mean. I have no idea what they're going to okay. go after next. Uh, uh, personally, I think we ought to start taxing the international transfer of funds. And that will give them something to fight for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm struck by uh, what seems to be a shift in the last 260 years away from this sense of ethics and morality that, um, that I believe was behind the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness line towards um, life, liberty, for some, and pursuit of profit. Um, and, and I understand, I, I comprehend the the idea of freedom to create something and not have not have everything done by a centralized method of production. I, you know, I, I comprehend how that makes society develop faster and, and possibly better. But I, um, I, you know, that what how you're describing the WTO and this Trans-Pacific and you know this ability to, I you know I I want to invent something that's going to pollute California's water so they should pay me to not do it you know so so meth production you know we should be you know they should just skip doing the illegal thing and threaten to do it and you know they they could die wealthy and, and without having to go to jail it's just i i you know there's something very twisted about the way you're describing it where where any base ethics is gone and how and why is that well, the one thing I would say is I, I always uh, I always dislike nostalgia. I always dislike this yeah. story that says you know back way back in your era, right? Things were a lot different, and you know we fought for things, yeah. right? And I, I think the story actually should be this: is that it's always been the case. It was never the case that the colonials were these great ethical people who believed that you know in liberty and justice for all. It was always about liberty and justice uh, and the pursuit of happiness for certain groups of people. The struggle has always been to try to widen the scope of who gets to enjoy those rights. Who gets to enjoy that freedom? Mm -hmm. and, right, and so what I think that we should focus in on is the questions about struggles for increasing democracy. Right? And there are all these kinds of struggles. The 14th Amendment trying to free slavery. Right? So there was this hidden history to it. Right? But there's also the question about abolishing slavery. The democratization movements about uh, making sure that uh, people who are in the Senate are not appointed, but directly elected. Right? Uh, the, uh, the, the enfranchisement of women, right? These are struggles of large numbers of people, mass mobilization through the use of direct action, not always the legal system, yeah. right? This is the thing that I worry about sometimes with focusing so much on move to amend and the constitutional amendment, right? Is if we just get the right law, right, then everything will be in place. No, what we see is the history is, is that, right, it's not unless large numbers of people are actively mobilized in the streets, making noises, disrupting things, that things get done. And it doesn't matter if you have the right person in power or the right person in the Supreme Court. Those things, those things can be important, but if, the, if you have a good person in office who's not being pushed by large numbers of people to do the right thing, nothing's going to get accomplished. So the history has to be, I think, instead of, right, what was it like back then, right, realizing it was never good to begin with, it's been made better, and we're making it better, and unless we actively try to do something to make it better, then the natural default is for concentrations of power to take their own, right, and that's what we see with this history, is a continuation of the concentration of wealth and privilege and power continuing on, now we're working at a global level. Right, and unless we figure out what are the ways in which we can mobilize on a global level as citizens, right, then, then the game is up. Right? It's that spread of democracy that we should be focusing in on. Okay, on that uh, note, let us uh, thank our panel for over time.